I guess there's no way possible to talk about John Fogarty's musical career and stay away from the bumps and ruts and the road it took. And that is a shame, because he is one of the greatest singer-songwriters in rock and roll. His unique voice, guitar sounds, and just the way he puts songs together is a thing of beauty. After growing up out in California, John, his brother Tom, and two friends, Stu and Doug, formed a band that was to become Creedence Clearwater Revival and took the rock and roll world by storm. With John leading the way, using his voice, lead guitar, and songwriting and arranging abilities, they were a hit machine. But it didn't last long. The run was short. Problems within the band. One even causing John's brother Tom to leave the group after only a few years, and then a total split of the others about a year later. And the problems seemed to grow worse after that. I hope you enjoy this upcoming video. If you do, give me a like and subscribe. I'd appreciate it. Now it's time to sort through some of the information that is out there and look back on the life and career of John Fogarty. John Cameron Fogarty was born on May 28, 1945. John was born in Berkeley, California and grew up in El Cerrito, California. He was the third of five boys. In junior high, John met Doug Clifford. Doug had a snare drum and an old set of hi-hats. John grabbed his amp and guitar and they started to jam. They got Stu Cook to join in and started doing some instrumental songs and playing around the local area as the Blue Velvets. Every once in a while, John's older brother Tom would sit in with them and play some guitar and sing. John said he didn't do much singing at all in those days. It took a few years, but Tom finally ended up becoming a permanent member of the band. Tom, being older, gave them some leadership and direction. John graduated El Cerrito High School in 1963. A few years later, as the war in Vietnam was beginning to ramp up in 1966, John walked into a recruiter's office around the same time his draft number came up. Whether as a draftee or a volunteer, he expected that he would be joining the military. When he left the recruiter's office, he signed on with the United States Army Reserves as a supply clerk. I was only on active duty for six months, but I was in the reserves for two years between 1966 and 68, John said. The band signed with Fantasy Records. As is the case with most young bands, they were offered a lopsided contract and without any negotiations, they signed it. Then without the band's knowledge or approval, Fantasy changed the band's name from the Blue Velvets to the Gollywogs and started dressing them up to fit the image they were trying to sell. The group recorded seven singles that were not very good or successful either, but got them enough recognition around the area to keep them traveling in their Volkswagen bus and playing gigs. John said he was writing songs by the time he was eight years old, but got really serious about it while he was in the reserves. John also started working on his singing around then. About this time, Fantasy Records was taken over by some different people, and the Gollywogs decided it was time to get serious. They went in and did a demo of the old Dale Hawkins song, Suzy Q, with Tom and John sharing lead vocals. And even though it was just a demo, the song took off, and so did the band, now named Creedence Clearwater Revival. After doing their first album, which included Suzy Q and the Screamin' Jay Hawkins number, I Put a Spell on You, the band seemed to be off and running. The only problem would be that the contract they signed was in the background, and it would end up owning this band later on. The second album, which featured hits such as Proud Mary and Born on the Bayou, saw John emerge as songwriter and lead vocalist which was pushing his older brother Tom back into the shadows. Let's just say something here. 
I can understand how his brother would feel, but when you are in a band and something is working and you want to make it, you go with what works. And what John was doing was working very well. After this, the hits just kept coming. John was emerging as the front man and the talent that kept the band scoring hit after hit. It seemed they could do no wrong musically, but internally things were not so good now. We must remember, even with all those hits, Creedence Clearwater was only together about four years. This was probably one of the most awesome runs in rock and roll history. Then the problems started coming to the surface. After a few years of success with John singing, writing, and arranging songs, the guys in the band decided they wanted more say. John seems to think the band was a bit jealous of his attention and let that stand in the way of what was best for the band musically. Tom had wrote some, but in John's opinion, he hadn't come along and was behind the time a little and he didn't think their fans would care for what he had to offer. Stu and Doug had never written a song. But John relented and said, okay, let's try it your way. Although he admitted he didn't have a lot of faith in it. But as we can see, it was already being a three against one atmosphere in the band. After that, they released the Pendulum album. Less than two months later, Tom Fogarty quit the band. The band's final album, Mardi Gras was released in April 1972. Remaining members, Stu Cook and Doug Clifford, shared the writing, singing, and production duties. Fogarty contributed only three original songs and sang lead on a fourth, a cover of the 1961 Ricky Nelson hit, Hello Mary Lou. Clifford and Cook each wrote and sang the lead vocals on three songs, the album was a commercial success, peaking at number 12 and going gold. The album contained two top 40 singles, both of which were written and contributed by John, Sweet Hitchhiker, and the swan song, Someday Never Comes. But without John's two hits on there, the album would have been a total flop. And on October 16, 1972, after a short U.S. tour to promote the album, the group announced their breakup. From 1968 to 1972, Credence released seven gold and platinum albums and ten gold or platinum singles. At its peak in 1969 and 1970, Credence outsold the Beatles at a time when the world seemed to revolve around them. After John, Stu, and Doug called it quits, John figured he could just go out and start all over, but the contract they had all signed said different. The other three was released from it, but John was held to it, and the bands, owing the record company 180 songs over the next seven-year period, and if he didn't meet the year's quota, it would just be added on to the end of the seven years. In other words, they owned him and his next 180 songs. But it was even more than that. Saul Zance and Fantasy owned half of the copyrights to all of the Creedence Clearwater songs, which meant they owned half of everything John Fogarty wrote and performed. So the four members owned half and Fantasy owned half. John basically went home, wrote some, and sat around some, and drank some, and then later on it got even worse and drove a deep wedge between John and the other three members as Stu, Doug, and Tom sold their votes in the band back to Saul Zance and Fantasy, leaving John with basically not a leg to stand on. When John confronted Stu and asked him why, here is what John said he had to say to him. John said, Stu, how could you guys sell your votes to Saul? You know what he is doing to me. He is my worst enemy. Stu said, I just got tired of being asked what movies this song should be in or what compilations should have what song. 
And besides, I don't care. I don't care about the music. Just give me the money. John said, and right there was the reason I didn't play at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame with them. I guess you could go on forever about this. The lawsuits and who said what, but it would take forever. I just know that them selling off to that company had to have hurt John something awful. Those were his songs and his creation. It cut him deep. John didn't even play CCR songs in his show for many, many years. Although time has changed that, John Fogarty went on to have a very successful solo career and wrote many more great songs. Tom Fogarty passed away in September of 1990. Stu and Doug are just a CCR cover band now and haven't really done much of anything in the studio on their own. I have heard John's shows a couple of times and no matter what musicians he had backing him, it still sounded like Creedence Clearwater Revival to me, he was the sound of that band. Can one musician make a band? I don't know. But John Fogarty sure comes as close as anybody I have ever heard. On a final note, I was glad to hear John say on an interview that the anger is gone. Good for him. But I bet the hurt is still there, even at age 76. As far as the reunion of John, Doug, and Stu, I would be totally shocked if it ever happened. Creedence Clearwater Revival left us with many, many songs that are timeless. A few of my favorites are Green River, which is also John's favorite, as he wrote it about a place in his childhood. I also like Looking Out My Back Door, Have You Ever Seen the Rain, and Traveling Band. Let me know some of your favorites in the comments section below and any comments about John and the band also. Thanks for watching. I know there's a lot more to talk about, but time is running short. Please like and subscribe. I'd appreciate it. Take care, y'all.